Give it another two minutes and then we will start. Give it another two minutes and then we will start. There was an echo there, Cole. I don't know. Um... Yeah, that was me. I've taken care of it. <sighs> okay. Okay, I'm going to uh, get started. Um, probably most everybody is in, but but more will come. Uh, and just to say, it's uh, good to see a number of uh, old and, and newer friends uh, who, who have joined us. That's very nice. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of Massachusetts Peace Action uh, and Code Pink. Uh, and I want to thank you for joining our session today, the negotiated settlement of the Russia-Ukraine conflict with Anatole Levin as our featured speaker. Anatole is joining us from the British countryside of Leicestershire. Uh, my name is Joseph Gerson. I'm a member of the Mass Peace Action Board and president of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. The Russia-Ukraine war is grinding on, and despite today's or yesterday's um, diplomatic session in Istanbul, Tuesday's actually, uh, it does not seem likely that the war and the killing uh, will end anytime soon. And even as Moscow has announced that it would be pulling back from the region near Kiev, uh, the longer the war goes on, uh, the greater the danger that an accident or serious miscalculation could trigger escalation into a broader and potentially even a nuclear war. A ceasefire and, and successful negotiations are thus all the more important and urgently needed. Every war, for better or worse, ends with a diplomatic agreement. What would an agreement ending the Ukraine war look like? What are Russia's goals and its bottom line? What can Russia and, uh, and Ukraine sacrifice in exchange for peace? What can Ukraine and Russia, I'm sorry, what can the US uh, uh, and uh, NATO, uh, what, 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 are, what are their goals? Uh, and, and are the mediation efforts by Turkey, France and other countries uh, at all useful? And what more is needed? And what can we as US civil society do uh, to press Congress to help bring the war to an end. To answer these questions, uh, and or at least begin to answer them, we've turned to Anatole Levin, an extraordinary British political scientist, journalist, and writer. He is now senior researcher on Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, the newly created Washington think tank, which promotes ideas designed to move US foreign policy away from endless war uh, and toward vigorous diplomacy in pursuit of international peace. Anatole is deeply involved in helping to develop diplomatic solutions that can bring the Ukraine war to an end and to build a reasonably just and enduring peace. Anatole served as a journalist in the former Soviet Union and South Asia from 1985 to 1998. He is the author of Ukraine and Russia, a fraternal rivalry that goes into the details of the complex ethical and political relationship between Russia and Ukraine. His most recent book is Climate Change and the Nation State. And although Anatole's accent informs us that he wasn't born in Boston or Brooklyn, his most recent article focuses on what 20th century US intellectuals can teach us about humility and restraint in war. Also, just to say, I was happy to see that he began that article, as I often do, with wisdom from a US Nobel laureate, Bob Dylan. Um, then first, just a few uh, housekeeping details. Our session today will go on for an hour until 2 p.m., um, at least for 2, 2 p.m. here on the East Coast. Anatole will speak for between 15 and 20 minutes. After that, we'll move into our question and answer period. Without the benefits of a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, with help from others, I'll do my best to keep track of them. Uh, and if you can keep your extraneous comments there to a minimum, that would be helpful. I should also add that this session is being recorded and will be posted on several websites, first and foremost, that of Massachusetts Peace Action. So much for preliminaries. Anatole, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure. And especially because as you said, um, our two organizations, you 
and the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, we have, I think, very much the, the same goals when it comes to the promotion of peace, um, the reduction of militarism and searches for international compromises, uh, which are not, of course, uh, either simple or, you know, necessarily always ethically clear cut. A compromise is a compromise. Unfortunately, you know, we may wish it wasn't, but it is. Uh, well, I'll begin by sketching what I see as the situation on the ground, um, then uh, talk about um, the, uh, the present peace process and the, the agendas of the two sides. And then, yes, at the end, uh, say something about what um, the United States and the West should be doing. Uh, well, firstly, uh, I, I think that we can take the Russian side uh, as sincere, up to a point, of course, in the present peace negotiations, uh, insofar that is, as they want a compromise peace with Ukraine, naturally, that favors what they see as Russia's essential goals, uh, for two reasons. The first and the most important uh, is that clearly Russia's invasion has not gone according to plan. Uh, the, we cannot say, of course, for sure what Putin's original plan was, but certainly by, from the disposition of Russian forces, it does look as if the intention was to either topple the Ukrainian government uh, or uh, to persuade it simply to bow to you know, all Russia's demands. Uh, that now looks a totally reckless, impossible, unfounded goal. But perhaps we should remember that at the start of the war, the, the United States offered uh, to evacuate President Zelensky from Ukraine. Uh, and he, to his immense credit, said, no, um, no, I'm not going to run away. I'm going to stay with my people and fight. And um, if, of course, he had run away, then it is possible that you, uh, Ukrainian resistance, or at least much of it, uh, might have collapsed. But of course, he didn't, and the Ukrainians didn't. Uh, and they have fought it out. Uh, above all, they fought it out in the cities uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and as a result, um, the Russian invasion has run into very serious problems. Uh, Russia deployed about half of its uh, already quite inadequate forces uh, to try to capture Kiev, and they haven't captured Kiev. Uh, but as a result of doing this, they had completely inadequate forces uh, for all their other operations. Uh, it's difficult, you know, adequately to express how badly planned the Russian uh, invasion was. They attacked a, a country of 230,000 square miles from six different directions with fewer than 200,000 men. Uh, you know, you don't have to be a military expert to see that um, that's unlikely to go well. Uh, and as a result, um, they've been fought to a standstill uh, in some areas and in others, uh, notably Mariupol, have been making only uh, very slow progress. They've also been suffering very heavy casualties. Now, we can't say for sure because, of course, there's propaganda on both sides. Uh, but um, the Ukrainians are claiming to have killed eight Russian generals, and I think they probably have, because if they hadn't, the Russians would have produced those generals alive. They haven't. Now, that indicates two things, um, heavy casualties and low morale. Generals don't lead from the front in that way, you know, unless their soldiers really need you know, inspiring. Uh, Putin... Uh, today or yesterday, announced that he's calling up another 130,000 Russian conscripts to the colors. Now, that is a really serious indication of difficulties, uh, because initially uh, it's clear that the, uh, that the Russians tried to avoid, as far as possible, using conscripts uh, in this war for obvious, very good domestic political reasons. Uh, so the Russian uh, offensive is faltering, and in consequence, the Russians of course, with a with a show of making this about um, you know the search for peace, are calling off their offensive against Kiev, and in order to redeploy their forces uh, to do something which they have not actually even managed to do yet in almost six weeks, which is capture the whole of the Donbass. And uh, the Russian government, of course, at the beginning of the war, recognised the independence of the 
Donbass separatist republics, and not only in the territory that those republics held, but in the whole territory of the provinces of Donetsk and Lugansk, which um, so far Russia has not actually been able fully to occupy. So yes, um, the Russian offensive is in difficulties. Uh, and um, now perhaps just one word here uh, about atrocities uh, and war crimes. I have no doubt that Russia has, you, you know, has displayed criminal you know, indifference to civilian lives. But it must be said that the Ukrainian defense has very largely depended, as it must do. I'm not blaming the Ukrainians for this in the slightest, but clearly their defense has involved digging in into urban areas uh, and defending them street by street. Now, if you do that, the attacking force uh, has the choice either uh, of simply calling off its offensive or, of course, traditionally, surrounding the cities concerned and starving them to death, which is not exactly a humanitarian option, or, of course, using massive firepower to blast the defenders out of their positions, uh, which is what, by the way, America has done again and again in its wars. Now, this, I'm afraid, according to the laws of war, does not constitute a war crime. Um, it is uh, the invasion of Ukraine could well be called a, a crime of aggression, which is, of course, one reason why the Russian government has I like America, by the way, in the past as well, has chosen not to describe it as a war, but as a special military operation. Uh, but I think we must be careful of double standards when it comes to uh, you know, accusations of deliberate atrocities and war crimes. Uh, if Well, for two reasons. One is because it does obviously raise uh, the issue in much of the rest of the world, particularly, of course, the Muslim world where I lived for many years. Um, uh, um, hypocrisy as far as America is concerned, but also because, of course, the threat to bring Russia and Putin before the International Criminal Court could become a major obstacle uh, to a peace settlement. Um, here, once again, is a case where uh, one's, you know, moral desires, and by the way, I should say that I, I absolutely regard this invasion as a, a deeply criminal act both from a human humanitarian point of view, but also under international law, uh, conflicts with the, the interests of peace. Now, as a result of the problems that uh, the, um, the Russian military have run into, uh, Russia has, I said it modified its, its original political goals, but it has also uh, scaled down um, its demands to the Ukrainians. Uh, Russia is, uh, has dropped its demand for the demilitarization of Ukraine, maybe some categories of missiles. It's dropped its demand uh, for the denazification of Ukraine. That was also always a very vague demand. Uh, and it seems to be willing um, not to drop its demand for recognition of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty uh, over um, Crimea and um, recognition of the independence of the Donbass republics. But from what I gather, uh, Russia is prepared uh, with, unfortunately, one huge qualification, probably to follow the uh, Ukrainian proposal that uh, these issues be compartmentalized and uh, made the subject of future negotiation. What, what this would mean, more or less, is uh, what happened in Cyprus. You know, after Turkey invaded Cyprus in 1974 and carved out the unrecognized, internationally unrecognized Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, um, this has been the, the idea, the, the prospect, the hope of Cypriot reunification has been the subject of, oh, I, I don't know how many rounds of international negotiation, which of course have never led anywhere. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the, there has not been a return to war. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, despite um, Cyprus being enmeshed in this uh, 
um, partition and territorial dispute, the Republic of Cyprus or Southern Cyprus uh, was able to join the European Union, which is rather an important point, of course, a very important point as far as Ukraine is concerned, uh, because uh, something else that Ukraine absolutely correctly is insisting on, uh, and Russia appears amazingly enough to have conceded, uh, is that um, uh, any treaty of neutrality uh, should leave Ukraine free to join the European Union whenever this should be possible. So a treaty of neutrality only applies to NATO as a military alliance. Uh, by the way, it also applies, we should remember this, it would rule out Ukraine being brought into, um, uh, in, into a Russian-led security alliance, which was Putin's hope, obviously, previously. So it does cut both ways. So you have, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, genuine moves from both sides uh, towards a peace settlement. And the Ukrainian proposals are, I think, very wise uh, and sensible. <clears throat> As President Zelensky has said, uh, since NATO repeatedly ruled out, refused, uh, not, not merely to admit Ukraine to NATO immediately, but even to provide NATO with any time frame for admission to NATO. Uh, clearly, um, there is no NATO willingness to fight to defend Ukraine, and therefore a treaty of neutrality makes excellent sense, as long as it is accompanied by very strong uh, guarantees, of course, international guarantees of Ukrainian security sovereignty. Uh, and of course, there are good international precedents for this. Um, Several countries in Europe are historically neutral, uh, either by treaty or by internal consensus, Switzerland, Sweden, Ireland, uh, and of course, since the Second World War, uh, Finland and Austria. Um, and uh, the Austrian state treaty you know, provided for the mutual withdrawal of Soviet, British and American occupying forces from Austria. Uh, and together with a guarantee of Austrian sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, it also, interestingly enough, had a provision, um, obviously in the wake of the Second World War, for Austrian laws banning uh, neo-Nazi parties. The <clears throat> Finnish uh, Treaty of Neutrality was not um, part of an international agreement, it was a bilateral agreement with the Soviet Union. There are two uh, interesting features of the Finnish um, Treaty of Neutrality. Uh, the first is that, um, as has often been said, and I think rightly, uh, <coughs> the reason why Stalin did not, even after winning basically military victory, um, try to incorporate Finland in the Soviet Union. And Finland was the only territory of the former Russian Empire, as it existed until 1917, that was not incorporated in the Soviet Union by Lenin or Stalin. Um, and the reason for that appears to be that the Finns put up such a tremendously hard fight against the Soviet army, that it convinced the Soviet um, government that it would simply be too much trouble to, to incorporate. Finland as part of the Soviet Union. Well, that, of course, is precisely what the Ukrainians have now done. You know, they have shown by their tremendous resistance uh, and courage and loyalty and the fact that, uh, of course, and this is of critical importance, resistance to the Russian invasion has, has been shown by uh, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in the east and south of the country, which is pretty clear that the Russian government expected, you know, would welcome the Russian invasion. They didn't. They have stayed loyal to, to Ukraine. This is a matter of tremendous importance. Um, so uh, I think that in the end, look, no international treaty ever, by the very nature of the international system, can provide for absolute security. There is no absolute security in this life or in this world. Uh, treaties can, al can always be broken. Um, I have to point out America has done that rather often over the past generation. Uh, but on the other hand, I do think that given the resistance of the Ukrainians, given the casualties and losses that Russia has suffered, it is highly unlikely, highly unlikely that if uh, Russia signs 
uh, the peace treaty with Ukraine that any Russian government would want to repeat this invasion in future. That is the greatest security for Ukraine. Of course, it must be backed up by other things. It must be backed up by the, the cast iron guarantee that if Russia does uh, break the treaty and invade again, it will be subjected to the full range of Western sanctions. I'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a second. But I think it is also worth perhaps pointing out that uh, contrary to many warnings at the time, uh, the Soviet Union did abide by uh, the terms of the treaties with Austria and Finland and did not use their neutrality uh, to invade them, subvert them, try to promote revolution, and so on. In fact, the Soviet Union uh, even withdrew its military base uh, from Finland 40 years before it was obliged to do so under the Finnish treaty. So, you know, there is a, a record there. Um, so uh, we have movement, you know, on, on both sides uh, towards a peace agreement. What is the chief remaining obstacle? Well, that I'm afraid is the Donbass, because as I said, uh, Ukraine appears willing to treat that uh, like Crimea uh, and subject it to uh, basically, you know, a long international diplomatic process, uh, while uh, of course, uh, demanding, but also guaranteeing that there will be no attempt by either side to change the situation on the ground by force. So, you know, one could imagine, you know, scenarios of, of a, um, a demilitarized zone, a United Nations peacekeeping force patrolling that zone. You know, there, there are plenty of international precedents for this. The problem is that, as I say, to date, Russia has not even occupied the full territory of the Donbass, on which it has recognized these otherwise unrecognized um, separatist republics. Uh, and clearly the, the Russian military strategy is now to do that, finally, um, you know, weeks into the war. Um, but it will be exceptionally difficult for Ukraine uh, to um, you know, not, not recognize, but negotiate on the basis of a ceasefire line, uh, which goes far beyond the ceasefire line where the war began six weeks ago uh, in, in the Donbass. Um, I fear, therefore, that uh, in eastern Ukraine, um, there will still be more fighting um, while Russia tries to consolidate that line. Uh, and on the one hand, Russia will try to hold considerable territories beyond that, that it has occupied in southern Ukraine, the so-called land bridge between Crimea and the Donbass, um, uh, as a bargaining counter, as a means of pressure on Ukraine, and also if there is no peace agreement, simply to hold it indefinitely. The Ukrainians, absolutely rightly, naturally, will uh, are conducting counterattacks, um, especially in the north around Kiev and Kharkov, to drive the Russians out of those areas. So although you, know, you could say that we have 90% of a peace settlement in place already, the 10% uh, is still going to cost many, many more lives. Now, as far as the, 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 the West is concerned, um, we clearly um, should be doing everything possible to promote uh, a peace settlement to end this war, um, a peace settlement that guarantees U uh, Ukrainian security, sovereignty, and of course, and this is critical, Ukraine's ability to move towards the West in real terms and you know, membership of the European Union. Uh, but quite apart from membership of the European Union, just the westernization of Ukraine. Um, economic reform, political reform, anti-corruption measures, and just the openness of Ukrainian society. Now, from this point of view, um, like 
don't take offense anyone who I'm looking at now. Uh, we're all I fear of a certain age. Um, I am, I don't mean everybody in the audience, but um, uh, I am old enough uh, to, to have visited Finland and Austria during the Cold War. Of course, they were not part of NATO, they weren't even part of the European Union during the Cold War. Uh, but uh, if you didn't know that, if you had visited those countries without knowing that, you would never have known that they were not part of the West. They were fully part of the West. Finland in particular, of course, including during the Cold War, has always rated at the top or very close to the top uh, for life satisfaction, quality of life. And Austria, by the way, has also been very close to the top. The fact that they were not in NATO did not mean that they were not part of the West, that they were not democracies, that they were not successful uh, social market economies. They were. So I think we need to keep that firmly in mind. Um, and what I think we all have a duty to do, um, if you know, we actually do care about the well-being of the Ukrainian people, uh, is to make sure that Western sanctions, which, by the way, I totally agree with that Russia should have been very, it was right, very harshly to sanction Russia uh, for the war. Uh, but uh, these sanctions were imposed, um, I mean, the new ones this year, uh, in retaliation for Russia's invasion of Ukraine they must be directed towards the goal of ending the invasion, bringing about a peace agreement and Russian withdrawal. Um, they must not be used, as it is absolutely clear, and indeed many people, Elliot Cohen and others, have made explicitly clear their goal, uh, which is to use them for regime change in Russia, uh, and um, not just regime change, but uh, to weaken uh, and there is a, certainly a, a very widespread suspicion in Russia uh, to destroy Russia as a state um, in order to strengthen America's geopolitical position and isolate China. Uh, and um, of course, that agenda would be pursued over the bodies of innumerable Ukrainians, just as America's geopolitical agenda in Afghanistan in the 1980s, a war I also covered as a journalist from the side of the Mujahideen. But that American agenda uh, was pursued over the bodies of innumerable Afghans and at the cost of the destruction of the Afghan state, uh, with consequences, of course, which came back to bite America itself terribly 10 years on. Uh, so um, I think there is this huge obstacle of the Donbass, but on the other hand, there are good grounds for peace. Um, produced above all, once again, by the, the courage and resistance of the Ukrainian people. And I think it is, uh, it is our duty to support um, these moves for peace as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Anatole. It was a broad and I think very, very helpful presentation. Um, I, I know I learned a number of things in, in, in relationship to the status of negotiations at, at the moment. Uh, let me remind people that if you want to pose a question to Anatole, please put your question in the Q and in the I'm sorry in in, in the chat box there, uh, and with uh, help from uh, Cole and, and others here, I'll be able to, to try and keep track of them. So please put your questions into the chat. Then maybe a, a question which uh, came in early uh, and which may be on the minds of many people who are here uh, from Thomas Baker. Uh, is the U.S. actually working toward a quick end to the fighting? Well, that is you know, that is very much an open question, um, and there is deep ambiguity uh, from the Biden administration uh, on that. Um, obviously, there was a a gaff uh, by Biden when he said that Putin could not remain in in power. Uh, but by the way. Uh, you know, th that is a goal with which I have deep personal sympathy. I would also very much like, very much like to see Putin removed from power. Uh, but, you know, we have to recognize that, um, you know, America has used sanctions to this end several times over by now. In the case of Cuba, for 60 years, in the case of Iran for decades, Cuba, Iran, Iraq, Venezuela, North Korea, 
the only cases where there is some suggestion that it might have worked are South, uh, South Africa and Serbia. In the great majority of cases, it has failed as a strategy. There have even been strong arguments um, that uh, this has, has strengthened the regime's concerned. And there are, by the way, signs of that in Russia as well today, as the, the Russian regime consolidates its hold on the economy, its grip on the elites, its grip on the media, but also as there are you know, there is evidence that um, this sense, you know, of the West being implacably against us is actually creating increased support for Putin in the population and even in sections of the elite who at the beginning of the war were absolutely horrified by by the invasion. So um, I think it is, yeah, I mean, once again, I, I am not sure that um, the Biden administration, let alone the wider American establishment, is actually committed to peace in Ukraine. And I think we, we need to really keep them up to the mark on that. Another question um, kind of following on uh, around US policy, uh, several kind of relating to the question of war crimes uh, and uh, the International Criminal Court. Um, you know, one question is how can a, a war criminal make uh, demands uh, and here, I mean, the, the, the kind of related question would be with the United States not having uh, joined the International Criminal Court, uh, how, how can it be making similar de you know, demands on Russia? And the other is that uh, when Russian forces deliberately target buildings sheltering women and children and the elderly or bomb uh, clearly residential buildings, along with preventing innocent people from trying to escape these attacks, don't these constitute war crimes? Well, I mean, the answer to the first is, um, you know, many people in the world uh, thought that the invasion of Iraq was a crime of aggression, but you still had to go on talking to the Russian government, uh, Russian, I'm sorry, American government, because it was the American government and you had to go on talking to America. Uh, you know, I was a journalist in, uh, in Afghanistan um, and then in recent years, I, since um, the fall of the Taliban. I also made several visits to Afghanistan. Uh, I was part of track two efforts in Afghanistan. I was also part of track two diplomacy efforts between India and Pakistan. Now, you know, on both sides in Afghanistan, uh, both in the 1980s and then in a different way, you know, under us, uh, you were dealing with very nasty people, at least on one side, frequently on both sides. India and Pakistan both have, you know, a very long row of crimes um, to their name, regrettably. But you know, this, I'm sorry to say, this is the world. Um, the Arab-Israeli peace process was not made between nice people on either side, mostly. Not that that led to anything in the end, but it involved, you know, dealing with um, some profoundly unpleasant dictators. Uh, you, you know, the world is not as we would wish it. Um, and uh, you're kind enough to mention, Joseph, that you know my latest book is on climate change. This is an issue I take immensely seriously. If we are, you know, to promote serious international cooperation against climate change, you know, it won't only be with nice Western democracies. Uh, as a matter of fact, the countries with the worst record on a per capita basis for greenhouse gas emissions are in fact a row not merely of democracies, but of Anglo-Saxon democracies, if you can call them that, America, Australia and Canada. You know, we have to deal with the Chinese. We don't have to like it, but we have to recognize the fact. And if we want, you know, if we want to promote peace in Ukraine, we have to deal with the Russian government. Otherwise, this war will go on forever. Then a question sort of following up on that from Melissa McClure, what additional strategies, measures and so on, do you believe the US and other countries could do to help support Ukraine and get Russia to withdraw their military forces right now? Well, uh, Western military supplies to Ukraine have been enormously useful. You know, there has been all this attention to you know, the need for a, no, a Western imposed no fly zone, that's not going to happen because that means NATO going to war with Russia and that will be vetoed, you know, well, 
Biden administration has ruled it out, the Germans, the British, everybody's ruled it out. Uh, but there's also been the suggestion of, you know, transferring uh, warplanes to Ukraine, which would obviously mean a drastic uh, escalation. Um, but at, which, you know, and, and all of this suggests that, um, you know, we, we haven't really been helping Ukraine. But in fact, the kind of weapons that we've been providing, Javelin anti-tank missiles, Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, have been very much the kind of weapons that Ukraine needs for the defensive urban warfare that Ukraine has been fighting. Um, they have clearly been enormously effective uh, against Russian helicopters and attack helicopters and against Russian armor. That must continue. Of course, we must continue to supply you know, these, these weapons and ammunition for them. Uh, the uh, other things we must do, of course, is um, provide economic aid to Ukraine, uh, maintain sanctions on Russia, uh, but as I say, sanctions in support of peace, you know, not of wider US geopolitical agendas. Uh, sorry, did you ask about war crimes? Well, I think we had, I think we had dealt with that. Well, the question there was was uh, I think you answered it in terms of how can the U.S. be calling for um, Russia to be held accountable for war crimes, given what the United States has done in not being part of the ICC. I want to come to a question here, if I can, from Carol Baum, who asked, "How does guaranteeing Ukrainian sovereignty work? How would that be different from Ukraine joining NATO?" It would be along the lines of the Austrian State Treaty. All the participating powers guarantee um, Ukrainian sovereignty, independence, guarantee non-interference in Ukraine's internal affairs. And, um, well, this is where the territorial issue comes in, of course, but the, there could be, look, you know, if there is enough diplomatic will, you know, if all sides want an agreement, then things can be fudged. There, you know, there can be, Russia guarantees Ukrainian territorial integrity bracket of the whole of Ukraine minus Crimea and the Donbass uh, area, which is the subject of international negotiation. But Russia guarantees firmly not to uh, try to seize additional Ukrainian territory, which after all, you know, a lot of Russians would like to do. Uh, and the, the, the West commits itself once again to the resumption of the fullest possible economic sanctions against Russia. Now, beyond that, I'm afraid you know, the, this U Ukrainian d d demand for actual, you know, promises of the West to go to war to defend Ukraine uh, if a treaty of neutrality is violated. I mean, that has really shown the West up. And I laughed bitterly um, about my own country, Britain, after all these, you know, all this big talk of solidarity with Ukraine and resistance to Russia. And uh, we've just had a statement by the British Deputy Prime Minister saying, no, no, we're, we're not going to guarantee the security of Ukraine as part of any treaty of neutrality because Ukraine is not in NATO and therefore we have no obligation to come to the defense of Ukraine. You know, I mean, that really says it all about the hypocrisy of NATO and the moral cowardice that it has shown since the beginning of this crisis. Ukraine is not gonna get that guarantee from, from NATO. So we have to rely uh, on a combination of you know, diplomatic agreements, international pressure, and economic sanctions. I would also suggest perhaps that, um, uh, you know, the neutrality would, would mean, and the guarantees would also mean that NATO can't be fully present in Ukraine. Uh, it can't be adding to the, what the Russians perceive uh, as a growing danger uh, on, their, uh, on their Western flank. Yes, I mean, no, uh, no NATO bases in, in Ukraine and possibly, um, uh, you know, the um, certain limitations on uh, 
uh, Ukrainian weaponry, you know, intermediate range missiles, for example. By the way, um, if um, if Ukraine uh, guaranteed not to buy certain categories of weapons from NATO, this would be a gift to the Swedish military industrial complex, since Ukraine could then buy it from the Swedes. It's kind of moving back in time, but part of, laying, part of the foundation for where we are now, uh, Faye Strigler asks, uh, can you comment on the 2014 coup that brought in a government friendly to the West? Well, I wouldn't describe it myself as a coup. It had aspects of a coup, but it also had aspects of a popular revolution. Um, and um, clearly, uh, what this demonstrated was um, that, uh, you know, look, it, it's always difficult to say in revolutions because, you know, you have street power and then you have, you know, whatever the mass of the population wants. But certainly what that demonstrated was um, that huge numbers of Ukrainians were absolutely determined not to join a Russian dominated alliance, economic bloc or security alliance or anything of that sort. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they defeated the plans by Putin and the President Yanukovych uh, to, to, to bring that about. Now, um, on the other hand, of course, uh, Yanukovych was elected. Um, he was the elected president in an you know, election that was generally certified uh, as free. And he was overthrown by street power and in the end by armed street power in which it must be said that uh, extreme nationalist groups played a leading part. And that did overthrow um, uh, the, um, the, the not, not just the elected government, but uh, also an agreement which Russia and the West had come to, a very reasonable agreement, which is that um, uh, you would have early elections uh, in Ukraine, um, early presidential elections, you know, leading to a democratic solution, which I'm sure would have led to the, um, uh, you know, to Yanukovych being vo voted out of office. So, you know, one has to recognize that this was a popular revolution. But I think, you know, at the same time, um, you know, you, you do, to be fair, have to understand, uh, you know, why Russia uh, was so angry and concerned about this, particularly given the um, uh, a number of things. Um, the obvious hand of the United States in manipulating what happened in the famous intercepted telephone call by Victoria Newland. Uh, and of course, the fact that um, uh, this was followed by some fairly uh, repressive, well, some violent actions, you know, pro-Russian protesters in Odessa were massacred. Um, and uh, also, I mean, some pretty severe repression of pro-Russian uh, political parties and media outlets and businessmen. So, uh, you know, look, none of this in any way justifies Putin's, as I say, absolutely criminal uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but, um, you know, once again, one does have to keep in mind um, that America, whenever there has been any chance of a hostile military alliance appearing in Central America, uh, has it may not in recent decades have invaded, uh, but it has certainly used some pretty ruthless means to make sure that that does not happen. And it's, um, it is perhaps odd to ask Russia to be less paranoid than the United States in that regard. I'm going to jump in and use the chair's uh, prerogative here um, uh, in the context of not legitimating the Russian invasion, but recognizing, too, we, we need to look at Ukraine as it is and not as we would like it to be. Uh, it would be helpful if you could comment on both the um, your take uh, on the uh, strength and, and presence of, uh, of uh, neo-Nazi forces and uh, reports that uh, that uh, uh, Zelensky has, has outlawed uh, opposition party or opposition uh, politicians. 
Well, the Russian charge, you know, that Ukraine was a sort of Nazi state, it, it was, of course, absolutely grotesque, as you know, as President Zelensky <laughs> pointed out, it is hardly likely that a Russian speaking Jew would preside over a Nazi state in Ukraine. And as far as electoral support is concerned, the absolute maximum vote uh, gained by a far right party uh, in Ukraine in uh, 2012 uh, was uh, 10, 10%, 11%, about that. Um, since, since then, it's gone way down. Um, you know, if, if you put all the right-wing parties together at the last elections, they got less than 5%. Uh, however, um, what, have, what is true is, is that the far-right parties and their paramilitary wings do have a great deal of street power, um, which they have used many Western media reports of this, to intimidate and in some cases attack political opponents and, of course, also cultural forces of which they disapprove, including, you know, there, there have been a number of attacks on um, LGBTQ rights marches uh, and attacks on um, media that have criticised them. Um, now, in addition, um, these forces have gained both prestige but also weaponry from uh, their genuinely very courageous fight in the Donbass over the past eight years and of course even more so today. Uh, the most uh, famous um, uh, extreme nationalist paramilitary group, the Azov Regiment, uh, they were named because they recaptured Mariupol from the separatists uh, in 2014. And of course, they are now uh, a key part of the defense of Mariupol, the heroic defense of Mariupol against, you know, overwhelming odds. Uh, and this, you see, will undoubtedly also give them uh, considerably added prestige in post-war Ukraine. Um, and, um, you know, w w we know, alas, uh, from the example, well, of the Italian fascists, for example, uh, after the First World War, whose electoral support was very small, uh, but um, who uh, did, you know, have genuine prestige because they had, you know, many of their members had genuinely been among the bravest Italian soldiers in the First World War. So uh, there is a potential problem here. Um, and, you know, you, you, on the other hand, of course, something which is wonderful, as I've written, uh, for Ukraine, uh, for Ukraine's move towards the, the West, and perhaps uh, also even maybe, maybe one day for Russia, although difficult though that may be to imagine at present. But the fact that President Zelensky has also emerged as, you know, as a great Ukrainian national hero, but also, um, you, you know, to some extent, even uh, for at least some Russian liberals, uh, you know, and Zelensky is, of course, you know, as I say, Jewish, Russian speaking by origin, liberal by politics, uh, although, <laughs> well, you know, in the circumstances of war, liberalism does have a tendency to get thrown out of the window. Um, is, I think, uh, you know, a very, a very good and positive and hopeful sign uh, for Ukraine in future. Now, that said, of course, um, Zelensky, like his predecessor, uh, has cracked down on um, uh, pro-Russian elements in Ukraine uh, in, you know, in the months and year leading to the war. Um, one can understand that, you know, given the threat to Ukraine, uh, whether it was wise or not, given that it a appears to have been another factor in, you know, motivating Putin to escalate uh, the, the, the pressure is, you know, is another matter. But certainly, I'd just like to say strongly um, that uh, there is a neo-fascist problem in Ukraine, but it is nothing remotely as great as Russia made out. And by the way, once again, it does appear from Russian statements that the, the Russians have actually dropped that 
the demand for denazification. So they, you, you know, they, they too appear, you know, to be scaling back their originally, I mean, totally illegitimate demand. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to take a question here from Jeff Klein, um, Mass Peace Action. Uh, wants to know what is the role of U.S. NATO military aid to the Ukraine other than prolonging the war and hindering diplomatic negotiated outcome? Well, I mean, it's to help the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians resist Russian invasion. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> just that, and and obviously um, the the aid given by uh, NATO before the war uh, ha helped, you know, did help fight Russia to a standstill outside Kiev and Kharkov and, and uh, Mikolaev. So, um, yeah, just that. Now, on the other hand, uh, and, and by the way, I, I'm not saying that NATO should not have given that kind of aid to Ukraine, but before the war, given that it was absolutely clear that NATO was never going to fight to defend Ukraine. Given that, as Zelensky has said, NATO ruled out any prospect of Ukraine actually joining NATO, you really have to ask two things. Why then, given that now every sensible observer, you know, with Ukrainian interests at heart, uh, says that a treaty of neutrality, you know, has to be part of a peace settlement. Um, why did we not propose a peace settlement with the greatest possible guarantees before the war? Because I do believe that given that this was always the chief Russian demand, if the West had done that, I think, you know, obviously, tensions would not have gone away, Putin's ambitions would not have gone away. But I do think that it would have been impossible for Putin actually to launch the invasion, the war itself. And secondly, given that every observer admitted, every person I know admitted in private, that it was going to be impossible to recover Crimea for Ukraine, and impossible for Ukraine to reconquer the separatist bits of the Donbass by military force, what did we think we were doing by you know, conducting uh, naval exercises uh, in the territorial waters of Ukraine, uh, doing nothing to promote a peace process for the Donbass, not telling the Ukrainians that it was very foolish to blockade Crimea's water, given that there was no possibility you know, of Russia abandoning Crimea once it had formally annexed it. In other words, you know, we should have combined support for Ukraine and help against a possible Russian invasion with uh, serious attempts to reduce tension uh, and, um, uh, re you know, and find uh, you know, a diplomatic solution that would have prevented the war. And I'm sorry to say that the, the, the chief reason why the West did not do this uh, was a combination of geopolitical ambition and sheer moral cowardice. It would have been, you know, the Biden administration would have been accused of weakness by the Republicans. It would have required the Europeans to confront America, and nobody had the guts for that. I, asked, I really appreciate that. And many of us made those arguments in the period leading up to the war. Um, a question here kind of brings us a little bit closer to your home. A question from Steve Engel. Uh, does the history of the Ireland conflict and its partial resolution provide any useful insights into the current crisis, especially in Donbass? Well, the, um, the, 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 there's, there's a par one, I hope, positive parallel and one of obviously not so positive parallel. Uh, I'm half Irish, by the way. Um, the positive parallel is, of course, that from 1922 until the uh, the Northern Irish Peace Agreement of 1999, uh, the Irish Constitution continued to refuse to recognise that Northern Ireland was part of Great Britain. Um, uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, in practice, this meant nothing as far as Irish state policies were concerned. Um, when I was a kid, visited Ireland with my parents, uh, the British pound was still legal tender uh, in Ireland because, of course, so many uh, Irish people were working 
uh, in Britain and bringing their pounds back. Ireland was in effect part of the British economic zone. That changed as a result of Ireland and Britain joining the European Union. Now, of course, Britain's left the European Union again, unfortunately. But I mean, I think what that does indicate, uh, like the Cypriot issue, by the way, uh, is that um, you, you know you can have international disputes uh, that last a very very long time without having to involve war between the states concerned. Um, but of course the uh, uh, and but the, the the negative thing is 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 of course that uh, that didn't rule out um, civil war in Northern Ireland. Uh, but that was because of you know a population balance in Northern Ireland, which doesn't doesn't apply as far as Crimea and the separatist bits of the Donbass until this war were concerned. But of course, one reason why it would probably be better for Russia not to uh, annex the rest of the or, or not to separate the rest of the Donbass and certainly not to separate any more areas of Ukraine is that I think it, it, it is absolutely clear now uh, that in these occupied areas Russia would face bitter discontent and unrest uh, and possibly you know terrorism from, uh, from from the populations that had conquered so I think there the, the you know there could be a, a Northern Irish lesson for Russia um, as well. So thank you for that. That was very, very helpful. And, you know, overall, your your really broad and, and deep analysis here. I, I want to close here with a, a question, uh, recognizing that most of our audience are peace activists or people committed to peace here in the United States. What would you advise in terms of what we can best do in terms of civil society to help help bring the war to an end uh, and as justly as possible? Uh, I, I would advocate um, strong support for harsh sanctions against Russia, but categorically linked to that these sanctions are to bring about peace, to bring about a peace settlement. Um, that's the first thing. Secondly, um, uh, I would strongly oppose this being used as an excuse for uh, higher military spending by the US. Uh, and I, I wouldn't, by the way, I would not necessarily have said this six weeks ago if told that Russia was going to invade. But I think, you know, look, what, what we've seen is if the Russian army cannot capture cities 20 miles from Russia's borders, then the chances of Russia invading NATO are zero. Zero. The, the Russian army just does not have it in it to do so. So there is no need for us uh, to spend tens, hundreds of billions more uh, dollars on defense. Now, obviously, the commitment to our allies in NATO must remain firm, but it can remain firm, you know, without plunging into, you know, a new round of colossal spending when, you know, climate change, among other things, you know, as Robert Reich keeps reminding us, as President Eisenhower, the greatest general certainly in 20th century America reminders, you know, every warplane, every warship takes away money from hospitals, schools, essential domestic tasks. That was Eisenhower, not a softy or coward or, 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 or weakling. So, I mean, I think that's the second thing, you know, that uh, we, should, um, we, we should firmly keep in mind. Anatole, I want to thank you very much for giving us your time and sharing your, your, your wisdom and knowledge uh, with us today. I also want to wish you the very best as you do your work contributing to uh, both track two and, and other discussions in terms of how best to uh, move toward a negotiated conclusion to the war as soon as possible. I want to thank everybody who has joined us. Uh, I want to ask if Cole or someone else can put the... Um, Mass Peace Action and the Code Pink websites uh, into the chat. Uh, I want to call people's attention to, to them and to the numerous uh, webinars and other activities uh, that they, they have planned. So 
Uh, we'll close here, but maybe ask people to hold on a little bit longer so we can get those those um, uh, web web pages uh, up on your up on your screen. And uh, just then to to thank everybody for joining us and to urge you to do what you can uh, to um, help bring this war to an end uh, and to uh, resist uh, uh, resist the crimes of empire. Uh, in order that, among other things, we might be able to address climate change uh, and, um, and and the continuing nuclear threat. Thank you so much. Thank you. It it was a, a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.